¿Aún no te ha registrado al evento del año? Google Cloud Summit Madrid está de vuelta. El próximo 23 de mayo, en el Estadio Civitas Metropolitano, únete a miles de profesionales que, como tú, conforman la comunidad de la nube en el evento más grande de la historia de Google Cloud España. Acompáñanos a explorar con nuestros expertos, partners y clientes las últimas novedades en inteligencia artificial generativa, seguridad, sostenibilidad o soberanía. El aforo es limitado, por lo que te recomendamos reservar ya tu plaza. Recuerda, Google Cloud Summit Madrid el próximo 23 de mayo. Nos vemos en la nube. Good morning, everyone. How are you, Gus? Good morning. Doing great, and you? All good. All good. Who's, who's our guest today? Who's with us? So our guest today is Carlos Torres from Fintech Collective. Carlos is a Spaniard living in New York uh, and other cities in the U.S. for quite some time. Uh, actually, he's lived in 10 cities in six countries, and he can tell us a little more about that. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Carlos, so we usually start with more of the personal story of our guests. So tell us a bit about yourself, especially with, with that intro that Gustavo mentioned. Where did you, where were you born? Where did you grow up? What did you study? And how did you make it into the professional world? Of course. Um, so originally Spanish uh, from Barcelona, as, as Gustavo mentioned. Um, I, am, I am half Brazilian, so Brazilian father. Um, and actually that's what led me to spend quite a bit of my, of my upbringing in, in, in Latin America. Um, so I had the chance to live in Brazil for five years growing up, Argentina, um, ended up, ended up doing high school in, in Miami, which arguably is maybe an extension of Latin America. Um, and then just stayed in the U S for, for my studies. Um, I began my career at, at JP Morgan where I traded financial derivatives. So FX options, very different to what I do today. Um, I think. Very, very exciting job. I mean, intellectually stimulating, but I realized that definitely from my lifestyle perspective, it, it's, it's not what I wanted to do. Sitting behind six screens all day and looking at markets go up and down was not exactly fulfilling to me. So I took a very different path. Um, and it came back to long, long hours, right? Long hours, but well paid, probably. Yeah, definitely well paid, definitely long hours. But actually, I would argue that, uh, what I do now is, is just as long hours and, and definitely my, my operating stint what was long hours. So actually, so I ended up moving to Colombia to help build a, a technology company, um, which is funny because I was working more for definitely a lot lower pay, but I was a lot happier. So, and, and that sort of put me on the path that I am today, right? I helped build a business called Suyo, uh, which basically we built a technology platform to formalize proper documents. So it was a technology company with a very large um, social impact angle. Um, and I was there for basically three years living out of Medellin, but scaling the business across the country. As the CEO of the company, it gave me an appreciation for what it is to build an early stage business in the region. And also it really gave me an appreciation for, for the fintech wave that was already beginning to unfold, but has definitely accelerated right in the six years since, since I left. It's now basically coming up on six years. Um, came back to the US to do my master's and that's how I came across Fintech Collective and now have been on the VC side for practically four years. Um, you know, more having, having made my way to being the partner at the firm that, that covers emerging markets. And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about that. Nice. So you never really worked in Spain, right? No, no, not really. Spanish diaspora. <laughs> yes. Tr truly yeah, Spanish yeah. diaspora. Truly. You, so, could, so, you could say. So going back to the beginning, yeah, you have sort of a different route than the, the usual finance uh, slash consulting background of um, VC, the VC crown. Um, so you, you studied political science and government in Rio, which um, uh, is not mm -hmm. exactly the ordinary path. Uh, you also did a master in public administration in Harvard Kennedy School. Um, mm -hmm. you, 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 you work now as an analyst and as, as an analyst and researcher in the foreign policy research the institute how did that shape you uh into becoming now an emerging markets investor i mean it, it was a very very um international upbringing right yeah for sure so i've i've always been i've always been fascinated by the interplay between financial markets and policy right in in really affecting the lives of people right and i think that that's Uh, that's probably the best way to, that's probably the best way to put it, right? Like, I think that in, in many ways, right? When you look at financial markets, you can't look at them standalone. There's always a policy angle behind it that is very guiding. I think, you know, probably, right? It, it, it helps that when I was, you know, leading up to university, the great financial crisis hit, right? And obviously the role of the, 
government in the US and in different countries in, in regulating the banking sector going forward was was crucial, right? So I think maybe that gave me a, an appreciation that people that had been in the financial markets the prior two decades uh, maybe wouldn't have seen as much. Uh, but yes, I mean, that's always been very relevant to me, right? And I think that in that sense, that, that, that always fascinated me. I think at the end of the day, the bottom line for me is thinking about impact. Um, and I think that fintech is definitely a massive catalyst for, for financial inclusion, right? But at the end of the day, that, that has to be accompanied by, by effective policy. Um, and in the field that I, I mean, in the field that I've chosen, right? The field of fintech, a hundred percent, uh, policy is extremely important, right? Like there's, you, you, especially when you look at emerging markets, if you don't understand how the regulator works and how the regulator thinks, you're arguably going to, you, you're very susceptible to make large mistakes, right? You cannot underestimate that. You know, I'm doing this right now sitting here in Sao Paulo. Uh, obviously the Brazilian regulator, the central bank, right? Has, is, is, is arguably the best regulator in the world when it comes to fintech, right? So that's a very good example of, of something gone right. You know, there's obviously examples of, of the opposite, unfortunately. So, so yeah, that, that's how I would, you know, that's, that's, that's how I would paint it, right? Like I've always, I've always seen both sides of the coin. I think in my, you know, looking forward in my life, I, I do have ambitions to, to transition into the public sector eventually. Definitely right now, much more focused on the private sector, but, but yeah, it's also something interesting. Why, so you have why that the Brasilia, sorry, yeah. why is the Brasilia regulator one of the best in the world, Carlos? Well, I mean, if you look at the conditions that they've established in here for, for the proliferation of, for the proliferation of fintech, it's, it's amazing, right? Like Peaks is not the first massively rolled out real time payment system in the world, but it is the one that scaled the fastest and arguably the most professional. Obviously also insanely cost efficient when you look at how much it costs. Um, and then even now, right? You look at like the different ways of open banking regulation and what that means. For a, from a financial, from a business model perspective for many fintechs, it's, it's next level, right? As someone pointed to me the other day, they're like, okay, like the only country, the only country that has real time payments, um, equivalent to Brazil is arguably India with UPI, which came first. Um, and the only country that has open banking regulation that is comparable to Brazil at this point is arguably the UK, right? So you're thinking about Europe, but few, arguably no country in the world has both to this degree. Um, and if you even look at some of the crypto regulation, in the roadmap, it's, it's even more forward looking, right? So, so yeah, I mean, I think for a country, for a country that traditionally has a reputation of being more bureaucratic and, and having a lot of red tape, I think it's, it's incredible what it has achieved. And, and especially considering that the UK didn't come from such a concentrated banking market. I mean, in Brazil, it was insanely concentrated, uh, in the yeah. top five banks. Uh, so you would have all the arguments to, to, to point that the Brazilian central bank would be like hijacked by these concentrated big banks, incredibly profitable and so forth. And in, in the end, it wasn't. I mean, the, 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 the decentralization effort that the Brazilian central bank started, um, in the beginning, in the banking sector, then in lending, then in all the verticals of the financial market. Um, it is, it's unbelievable. Even for Brazilians, it's unbelievable. Agreed. Agreed. So you have one side of the coin there in the policy side, and then you 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 went to the like the usual route. I mean, you studied economics at Wharton. You did your MBA at Wharton. You you went to work for JP Morgan um, in an international part. I mean, FX trading is is probably uh, when you, where you where you experience how how volatile emerging markets are, how different they are from developing markets, and so forth. Um, and then you, 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 you left, right? I mean, you left, like we're talking, you left a cushy job at JP Morgan, New York to move to Columbia to, to, to get into a startup land, uh, in the mission and so forth in an early stage startup. Um, how was that leap and how was, how important was that in your journey? Yeah. Uh, it was massively important. I think I would not be. I would not be where I am today had I not done that. Like, quite literally, right? I think uh, I, I always I always tell people that are interested in VC, right? Like, VC is a is a difficult industry to get into. Part of it is because there's not many jobs. Part of it is because there is the funds recruit in very different ways. So at the end of the day, you have to look at like the DNA of the founders and the managing partners. And I think that unless you're like trying to go for like Andreessen Horowitz or one of these Sequoia, one of these massive institutions, right? Like that, there it's it's a bit different. I I would assume, but but for, for funds that are more comparable to FTC, right? Like that, the DNA of the founders is becomes very important. So 
in our case, right, every single person in the partnership and even more broadly in the investment team has had operating experience and has either founded or built at the early stage. And we consider that to be crucial in order to invest in the style that we like, in order to hold board seats, have spent significant time with the teams and be able to make the impact that we seek to make, right? So so quite literally, right? I think, you know, when I was when I was trying to get into into venture capital, right, had had I not had this early stage experience and had I not made that leap, I would have not had the opportunity to join FinTech Collective. So that that's that's one thing. Um and and especially be, well, th- that's one thing, yeah, for sure. And then in terms of like making the leap itself, yeah, look, I mean, I think I think I, I, I was, as you said before, I, I was raised in a way that I had to go from country to country in my life. I didn't control the fact that my life every once in a while would get completely shaken up and I would have to sort of start again. And I think I came to realize the beauty of being able to reinvent myself in different phases of my life, um, work on different, because you, you get a bit of a blank slate, right? Like when you go into a different group of friends, like you are who you are, but they haven't seen you in the past necessarily. So it's not like you're, lying or presenting a side of you that's not true but but you certainly can you can definitely correct some things that maybe had made impressions in the past that that you didn't want to stick with whereas people that live in the same place their whole life right like what you've done defines you right and at that point you sort of you know you're you're you become a bit linked to that image right so i think i think i came to appreciate the beauty of that um and certainly my my upbringing made me very adaptable in that sense and it also made me yeah, so that that's from a personality perspective, right? So I think that when I when I made the leap of leaving JP Morgan, a lot of people were fascinated. I remember I met a lot of people. They were like, "How did you do it?" And I was like, "By doing it, right? Like you just have to take the step, right? Once you do that, you have to deal with the uncertainty." And I think my upbringing had prepared me to deal with with that uncertainty of what came after. Because when I left, I didn't have a job lined up. I I really wanted to take a bit of time to think about what was next. Um, at the same time, yeah, I think uh, you know I I, I realized that. You, you know, re-seeking behavior, if done in a way that is, that I think is, is well-founded in a way that is, that is intentional and meaningful and is aligned with your values makes sense, right? Like that's the only way to really pave your way in life and, 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 and create your journey, right? Like I think uniqueness definitely is, is important, especially in a world that is becoming more and more competitive in the labor market, right? And I think that. I realized that at JP Morgan, I was just not going to, I was not going to go down that route. But you know what I mean? It was a complex leap. I mean, you, you left a very, very big firm in a very, very big city, uh, international city, uh, stable and, and everything. You went to Colombia, which uh, um, was already on a positive path in 2015, uh, when Juan Manuel Santos and, 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 and so forth, uh, into a startup. So, I mean, it was, it was, I wouldn't say it was a double leap. It was probably a, a triple or, or quadruple leap there. Um, and, and the mission that you were speaking about. I mean, the mission from going, I mean, the mission at JP Morgan FX Trading is one. We can put it like that. And the mission in building um, homes for low-income families in Colombia is, a, is, is, is building on or, or helping them with the land titling and everything. It's completely another one. Um, how was that and how was the experience of, of, of taking the leap, living in Colombia, uh, building the team and so forth? How was the, the experience different? Well, the experience was massively different. Um, and that's what I, and that's what I liked. I mean, as you say, it, it really was a shock, right? Like I, I landed in Medellin on a Friday and Monday I was at work, right? And I remember my first day I walked into the office, which was a room in a co-working space. And there were four people there. And I remember like, I was like, oh, like, where's the rest of the team? And, and the CEO founder was like, no, 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 this, this is the team. Right. And I was like, okay, well, give me one second. I had to like, I went to the restroom. I remember I washed my face and I was like, I was like, wow, like what, what have I done? And, and where am I? Right. Like the, I've never been to the city. Now I'm in a room with four people and this is what I have signed up for. Um, yeah. So, so that was definitely, uh, that, you know, that, 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 that was definitely, uh, a shocking moment, but I think. Then what really encouraged me and what made the experience very different is that as opposed to having to price something that was intangible on something that's already intangible, which is a currency, right? An option on a currency. I was getting the chance to work with real people <clears throat> to, to actually build solutions that I could see that, that I, that I could more tangibly touch, you know, almost touch like the, the, the efforts of, right? Like I could see the, I could understand the importance 
of the homes to these people. And I could see why being excluded from the, you know, not having their documents formalized, excluded them from the formal financial system. And that sort of like created a perpetual cycle of poverty that a lot of families wouldn't, could, couldn't escape from, right? Even though they actually own those assets, right? So I think that maybe, uh, my, the social side of me, which I think is very present. And that's why I've ended up in venture capital, right? Of being able to work with teams, create teams and create impact that I could actually measure more tangibly linked to the intellectual side of understanding like the theory behind it and understanding more and, and coming to terms with the fact that like actually this, the, the, you know, the product of my work would result in, would, you know, would, would actually result in material impact. I think that the combination of both is what made me feel more comfortable and what actually, I think what motivated me, you know, and we took it from there. I mean, look, I, I initially, when I came there, I, I, I expected to spend six months and leave. I'd been as, as a backup plan, I had applied to grad school programs in the UK that were more academic, focused on international development. Um, and I ended up uh, postponing that twice and turning it down, right? Like when I decided to go to grad school eventually, which was two and a half years later, at that point, I realized that, no, I mean, what I wanted not, was not so much an academic path, even even though intellectually that interested me, what I wanted was actually to reinforce my skills to be able to build companies originally. And then I realized that, you know, that could also play out in the investment side, right? Um and I'm not married to the investment side, right? Like I think right now, obviously, I I very much enjoy where I am, and and I've joined the partnership, and obviously that's a that's a very strong commitment. But you know, I I, I do see a world one day where I could go back to being an operator. I haven't I haven't excluded that possibility. Operators in love with operators. So so in landed in landed in VC, we we have a discussion and in, in here in Brazilian venture capital uh, ecosystem about. How VC is a career. I mean, VC in Brazil is quite nascent. Uh, of course, it grew a lot. We have big firms. We have uh, firms that are already in the third or fourth fund and so forth. But the career itself, that part hasn't still evolved. I mean, you don't see people going from one firm to the other and so forth. And, and to be perfectly honest, I don't think you have that outside of the American or the UK systems. Um, you you being based in New York, how do you see VC as a career? Because I think you see it very differently yeah. from uh, from our standpoint here. Yeah, it's a very it's a very good question. You know, I, I honestly, you know, my journey in venture capital has been at fintech collective, and I and I do recognize that it has been very unique, and I'm I am very blessed, right? I arrived at FTC, and and sorry, I'm telling you this to answer the question, but basically, I, I think it's important to put this in perspective. I arrived at FTC at a fund that was raising their, they were soon going to begin raising their third fund. They had already made some initial investments in Latin America. They wanted to get stronger in Latin America. And that was my wedge into a full-time role there, right? Um, you know, I don't think many funds would have awarded me that opportunity. I don't think many funds at that point that were American were willing to actually incorporate Latin America into their core strategy like we have, and therefore deploy a significant amount of capital in the region intention, right? So, you know, yeah, again, like at that moment in time, you can probably count the amount of funds that would have done that on on on, on a hand, right? If that. Um, and, and even today, right? Like when you look at the amount of funds in the US that have true Latin American strategies, right? That are, and even emerging markets, right? That are focused on that and that have talent that is actually dedicated to pushing that forward. It's, it's not many. Right. So I do consider myself to be very blessed to be where I am and have this opportunity. I think we, you know, there's been a lot of effort to create a portfolio that I think is promising and, and therefore, you know, I, I trust will, will, will perform. Um, but when I think about VC as a career, right? Like you're right. Like there's not many, what I'm trying to say is that there's not many funds that would allow me to do what I do at FinTech Collective. Um, and therefore, if I left FinTech Collective, right? For whatever reason, someday I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what my, options would be, or at least where I would, where I would look really. Right. And that's why I truthfully say that, you know, there's a world where I would consider going back to being an operator if that were to happen. Right. So far, I'm extremely happy where I am, but if that were to happen, I, I might, I might do that because I, I do have, I, I do enjoy building, right. I have, I very much enjoy building our strategy in emerging markets and our portfolio, right. Like there's definitely like an entrepreneurial side to that. And if I were in a place that wouldn't give me that flexibility, and that way of working, I would not be as motivated, right? And that's where, again, the DNA of the founders is very important, right? Like the founders of FTC are people that are former operators, right? Brooks and Gareth, 
help build businesses for 15 to 20 years, four of them exited right before they began the firm, right? Like the way we work is very much, I, I think our mindset is very much that of an operator rather than, than that of a traditional investor. I think you're too humble, Carlos. I'm sure that if you wanted to live into, uh, leave your current position and find another another VC, I, I'm sure you, you could find a role. But g going back to going back to the Colombian story, uh, can, can you tell us a bit more about about Suyo, what you did there, what the company did, and, and how you helped scale that company? Of course. Um, so Suyo basically built a platform end to end to help formalize property documents um, that. That's a complex thing to explain, but you know, short version is basically there's many different levels of informality when it comes to a home from the very basic level of not having ownership of the land itself to people that have built, you know, happens frequently in emerging markets. People have built on top of the initial structure, several family families live there. You don't have the actual divisions separated between the families. Everything is done informally there, right? Like th there's many things you can add on. So basically we developed a model that was B2B2C where we would offer uh, we would offer that as an employee benefit, right? Um, across, uh, through, through big corporates that would, yeah, that would offer it as an employee benefit to the employees. Sorry. Um, and then we would do an initial assessment, right? We would create a diagnostic of what the person needs, right? And then we would engage with the person to be able to do those services, um, and charge a margin on top of that, right? That was basically the, the business model. Um, in terms of what I did, right? I, I focused on building the operation of the company. So initially I was more focused on go to market partnerships. But then I became the CEO of the company. And what that meant is that I had to structure the operational backend, which was no easy thing because we had to create teams of architects, engineers, and lawyers that would help do the diagnostic and then deal with the subsequent processes, as well as operationally organize those. Um, and then eventually I also took on sales, right? I created the sales organization. So I worked with different leadership teams in different markets that, you know, were, yeah, that were basically seeking to create the, that we're, that we're creating local sales teams and then scale them accordingly, right? So so that was the bulk of what I did. Um, yeah, it was an amazing experience. I mean, I was I was awarded the chance of making a lot of mistakes very young, right? Like I, I became the CEO of Suyo and I was like 25 years old, basically, right? So clearly I knew very little, but I had, you know, I had very good intentions. I had a lot of energy uh, and I think, and definitely, you know, and, and I had a background in business, right? So I think that definitely helped you know, earn me the the privilege of being there. But but yes, I mean, I I made many mistakes. Like I overhired massively. We overpaid for some things. We overspent on others. Like you know, I, I think I think looking back, th those lessons are incredibly valuable now that I have get to work with you know very young teams and I get to give them some advice on on how they're doing things. And you knew you wanted to stay just for a limited time and then go go back to the to the MBA or well, well you, you said before not to academia to to pursue like an academic career but you, you knew you wanted to go back to 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 MBA to school. Well, I would say a couple of things. Um, one thing is that look, I, I I went to Colombia looking for for an experience and I fell in love with a mission. Uh, but again, I have no relation to Colombia myself directly, and you know I, I didn't. I, I, I was distanced from friends, relatives, family, right? I, you know, I was sort of living in isolation in Colombia. Um, and I think that that definitely psychologically, that played a bit of an impact, right? It got to a point where I was like, okay, I've already been here for two, over two years, right? You know, how much longer and why? Um, and also, you know, at the end of the day, the Suyo model, um, as powerful as it was, it became, it became clear after a few years that it was not a traditional VC backed model. Some models are just not made for traditional venture capital, right? Um, and therefore, the pace of growth that the company was going to have was going to be slower than the blitz scaling that makes sense for a more VC backed model, um, you know, a successful one at least. And and at that point, I was like, okay, you know, I, I am I the person to really carry this operation forward? And I came to terms with the fact that I probably wasn't right. Like they needed someone that had more local knowledge, that was that had more patience for the stage of the company, and uh, and that was going to. I don't know, that was more rooted in, in Medellin and the place where the company was, right? So at that point is when I was like, okay, I think I'm ready for for my next move. I, I think I, it's very clear that the world of startups and venture capital is something I, I really like, uh, but it doesn't mean that I have to that I have to stay in this role necessarily. And and then what led you to FTC was was it the think tank side? And the, or or was it the, the emerging market side and the, the fintech came like as the major segment in the emerging market side? 
So I, I think both. Uh, what happened is that look when I when I was in when I was in Colombia, I I started working with several fintechs as ways to facilitate payment methods for our customers, because obviously cash collection for our model was quite difficult, right? Like showing up to neighborhoods, um, some of them that are more, you know, that 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 are you know lower strata, if you will, right? Um, and therefore, there's some inherent risk to that, literally, of picking up cash and you know, for our salespeople and driving away with it, not to mention that it's inefficient. Um, you know, that that was a problem, right? So I started discussing with different mobile wallets and different payment providers to see how how that could be made easier for our customer base. And that really put me in touch with sort of the fintech wave that was really beginning to to hit Colombia and obviously was only going to accelerate in the years after, right? So so that definitely that definitely sparked sparked my interest, right? And then obviously, you know, going back to Worthen, as you said, right? Like it's a place that is very finance uh, oriented. Uh, therefore, you know, for the new generation of MBAs, right? Like FitTech, the marriage of that with technology, very appealing. So there were classes at Wharton, there were clubs. And, you know, I, I started to spend more and more time thinking of FinTech as an actual concept um, and how that would look like. I realized that a lot of the work that I'd done in the past, right? I had worked in capital markets. Um, I had studied many things that were in the FinTech field. Um, made sense. And that's sort of why when, you know, when the opportunity of, of working at Fintech Collective came up and I noticed that they had a presence in emerging markets and they were specialists in this sector, that made a lot of sense with me. And also philosophically, because of the idea of, of generating financial inclusion, which at the end of the day is what Suyo was doing, right? By giving people land rights so that they could actually enter the financial system and use use those documents as collateral to take out loans and do things of that nature. You know, all those pieces sort of married together to to make a good combination. And that's why, and that's sort of why Fintech Collective made sense to me. And when we talk about emerging markets, which markets are we talking about other than Latin America? In what I do at FTC? Yeah. Yeah. So so that's mostly for today. Latin America is, is part of our core strategy alongside the US and Europe. Uh, we do have 10% of our fund that we dedicate to other regions that are of interest to us. And today it's most notably Africa and the Middle East. Um, today I'm a board observer in an African company that I'm very excited about called Sabi. I have led four different investments in Africa since I've been at the firm alongside uh, one of our senior associates called Samantha, who does a great job. Um, in the Middle East, I've been less directly involved. We have four investments there out of our most recent fund. Uh, but we have a venture partner that is based in the region. who used to be a full-time principal with us. So he does more of the sourcing and he's closer to those companies than, than I am. So so I want to seize the opportunity here. To, this is on, not something you always get on, on the podcast. How do you see all these markets comparing themselves? I mean, of course, in a, in a, in a general comment, um, in, in, in the fintech world, of course, you have the US more developed, but you have all these emerging markets. How are they in terms of regulation and opportunity, the, the, the founding teams, the startups, and then we can start going on... Uh, on the portfolio? Sure. Look, I, I think, so when you look at like the opportunity for FinTech and emerging markets and, and the share that it will be as, as the, in terms of the total FinTech opportunity, it's only going to increase, right? Um, you know, I, I think last year, right, if I'm not mistaken, QED and BCG did a joint report that I think quantified this very well. Um, in terms of how these markets compare, look, I think I think Latin America is in an extraordinary position in terms of emerging markets going forward. Let's begin with that because I think that if you look at if you look at emerging markets, right, you realize that, for example, East Asia, so to speak, especially China, right, like that's that that was once an emerging market. Now it's very much out of the question, right, given the the decoupling or however you want to call it with the U.S., right. But it, it is much harder, I mean, for Western investors to invest in China today. Right. And that's why a lot of funds have spun out their China operations. So, so that, that, that's a reality. Eastern Europe, unfortunately, has also deteriorated, right? In terms of, you know, investor appeal given the war in the Ukraine, given Russia's evolution, et cetera. Um, Africa, Sub Saharan Africa, I think is a fascinating region. In terms of development, it is significantly more complicated than Latin America. Um, when you look at several indices of development and also even the ability to actually create a fintech, you know, in any any large fintech, it seems in Africa, it basically has to be cross-border, which always brings an inherent level of complication, right? Which is something that when you look at Brazil or Mexico to some degree, is not as big of a concern, right? 
So that really leaves today, when you look at emerging markets, for me, the, the most palpable opportunities become Latin America alongside Southeast Asia and, and India. Um, so, you know, when I look at, when I look for inspiration for LATAM and things that might come, the market that I try to study the most is actually India. Um, and in fact, I was, I got the chance to spend a week in Bangalore at the start of December of last year, which was, which was enlightening. I mean, I think in many ways, right, the, the ecosystem there is more advanced. Um, and there's many things to learn. So, you know, I, I think those are the real, and, and, and sorry, I didn't mention the Middle East. The Middle East, needless to say, is, is, has ample opportunity, but it's going through a very difficult period at the moment, and we'll see how that evolves, right? And I think the opportunity in the Gulf is somewhat, you know, it's somewhat isolated from that. But, you know, when you think about that, there's inherent questions about market size, I would say, and a few other things. So, so I think when you look at that, like Latin really stands to benefit, I think, you know, Mexico, of course, more intertwined with the US, but with very interesting tailwinds, especially if we look at nearshoring. Um, and with remarkable macro stability, at least thus far, given the performance that we've seen in the last years. Um, and Brazil, I think in a, you know, in, in, in a position to become increasingly more relevant as a, as a commodity exporter and even oil exporter in many different ways, right? Um, and also in a position where you can play to the strengths of both China and the United States, um, and benefit from both. So, so, you know, putting, putting that in perspective, I, I am, very bullish on Latin America for, for some of those reasons. You think India is where Latin America is going to or, or, or less than the US? I think India I think India is more comparable. If you look at sort of like the social economic structure of India, I mean very different. Obviously India is many countries in one. But but yes, I think there are more similarities in how India works than in how the US works with countries in Latin America. Um, and the regulator, the RBI, has been building fintech infrastructure for even longer, right, than the central bank in Brazil. So there are there are interesting parallels, I think, with with what they're doing there for sure. I think the United States, in many ways, uh, provides an example of things of things that can be done. But I think that one of the biggest mistakes in Europe, to some degree, but I think that one of some of the biggest mistakes that we saw in 2021. And yeah, when, when in 2020, right, when the market, when the market really surged in terms of deals and valuations is that exaggerated pattern matching in many cases ended up being a mistake because the local idiosyncrasies are important enough that you cannot build X for LATAM, right? Like LATAM to some degrees needs companies that are fundamentally different because it is very different. Um, and that's where India, I think, provides a better example. Yeah, I was going to ask that because you not only has a, have a segment focus on fintech, but you also have deep knowledge on the on the markets. Uh, when you look at the time of the um, like the good old times of 2019, 2020, 2021, with the tourist capital, everybody was they didn't have all the knowledge, and they were looking for this quote unquote clone companies like the X of X, the X of Brazil, and the X of Mexico and India and so forth. Um, and you and you, and you in New York must have seen a lot of th th these things going on, right? The the counterparts of the venture capital industry that you relate with there were in, investing in India, Latam, and Middle East, looking for these clone companies, and that I would say didn't go so well, right? Yeah, I mean, of course, there's the you know there's examples of there's different examples, right? And it's it's difficult to generalize, but but yes, I saw I, I saw a lot of that, and I saw that also. I, I would say not only in many ways because the market was moving so fast that people with less thematic knowledge and less market context were making were making many deals, but also because honestly the scale of capital of those deals was often exaggerated because you had you had funds of magnitudes that are I think superior to the needs of the region um, that were deploying that that have that had a pressure to deploy that was such that they were fueling rounds that were arguably too large for the actual needs of the companies and the stage in which they were, right? Um, and it's the old story where if you give someone if you give someone $20 million and you tell them to spend it, they'll find ways to spend it, right? But it, it doesn't mean that they couldn't have done something similar with half the money um, and more efficiently. So so that was part of the distortion, right? Like I think that, you know, the access to, cap the access to capital or the supply of capital um, was not was was mismatched with the demand for capital at that stage in many ways, um, and I would even argue that, yeah, I mean, I, and 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 I think that that you know in, in many ways that makes the correction that came subsequently, you know, more aggressive, right? Because you have to 
correct to a lower baseline than you do in the US, right? Where the baseline was higher to start with. But, you know, but some companies were valued at prices that were equivalent to prices of companies in the US, right? So obviously much harder to go into those, especially when your revenue is in local currency and, uh, and the willingness to pay is different from customers in the US, right? So I think that made things, that made the correction tougher. And okay, how was that? that in, now. And, and how was right. that in Europe? How was that in Europe? Um, well, I, I, you know, I, I, I think Europe, the baseline was definitely not as high as the US, uh, but it was higher than in Latin America. So I would say somewhere in between. You were talking. You were talking now about the differences between the different emerging markets, Carlos. And, 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 but as a firm and you as a partner, I mean, what are you guys more more interested in? For example, in LATAM, across the different layers of the stack. So, for example, the infrastructure layer, the application layer. When it comes to fintech, what, what are you guys currently looking into and more and more interested in? Sure. Um, so, look, traditionally we have always like divided the fintech world into four broad categories. These are very broad, admittedly, right? Uh, one is bank and lending payments. Two, wealth and asset management. Three, capital markets. Four, insured debt. Um, I think that when I look at when I look at Latin America, right? You know, the the opportunities in wealth and asset management and capital markets are admittedly smaller than they are in developed markets, right? Just by sheer size and sophistication of the economies and the financial sectors, you know, they are small, right? Also than in Europe. So, you know, I, I think for those, right, we, we've done less investing in those in, in those buckets. Uh, we've done a good amount of stuff in banking, lending, and payments. But I think today, right, there's other there's other aspects, there's other categories that don't fit so neatly into this into these divisions that I think are extremely appealing, right? One of them is the idea, broadly speaking, of vertical SaaS. So the way I would describe that is the ability to create a software layer that is very engaging um, for a sub vertical of the real economy, right? You can then stack on financial service on top of that, probably as the main engine of modernization. You can probably build up payment functionalities, but most importantly, right, you're effectively digitizing um, an operational platform for, again, a segment of the economy that is extremely still paper-based, right? So, you know, we invest in a company, we let the seed round and then, you know, participated meaningfully in the series of a company called Matilda in Mexico. Uh, they're doing that for education, private education, K-12, through higher ed. They're already in three countries, Mexico, where they started, as well as Peru and, sorry, not Peru, um, Colombia and Ecuador. Um, and I think that's a very good example, right? Like they're very similar to a company called Isaac that was pretty renowned here in Brazil and that raised quite a bit of money. Um, you know, we are now, we've been very focused on similar opportunities in the healthcare space in Brazil, right? The idea of building a, a minimum viable operating system, right? For small clinics and even medical solopreneurs, or consultorios, as they call them here, right? Like, I think, I think that's very interesting. I think, you know, Martinez Covari has has spoken a lot about from Jay has spoken a lot about how, in many ways, healthcare is probably going to follow the consolidation that we've seen in, in education in Latin America. They see that as a big opportunity. I agree. So, so that's interesting. But there's other sectors, right? Like construction, for example, is one that I find very interesting. Um, arguably, there's more opportunities there on the on the agricultural side. So, I think that that's definitely. That, that, that theme is something I like um, and something that I think that if you get in early enough has interesting exit has interesting exit prospects, especially in Brazil. Um, then, I mean, look, I, we also, I also like uh, B2B software that you can sell into the financial enterprise, right? That doesn't fit as neatly into the buckets that I described again. But for example, our investment in Symmetric so far is extremely promising, right? Symmetric is proving the ability to build software from the region that can be exported outside of the region. They were basically invited by or asked by uh, regional customers, sorry, uh, local customers like eBanks and the local to help them operate in other countries, mostly emerging markets, but really across the world. Um, and today they're signing net new customers in India and Southeast Asia, which we're, ex which we're very excited about. They raised a, a large Series B that was announced a couple of months ago, $55 million led by Goldman Sachs. Um, so... You know, the idea of having companies like that in Latin America um, that are operating in different parts of the of the CFO stack potentially, but even other use cases, I think is very interesting. That's where you see like, you know, the potential of 
you know, you see the example rather that was set, for example, by Cloudwalk, you no, know, which I think now is admittedly seeking to sell into the United States, right? Um, there is potential for companies like that in the region, and these can be home run plays. The problem is probably not many of them, right? Like I think it's obviously very they're more outlier returns. So you have several topics that you opened up there. Uh, th the first one is in Brazil is very common this thing about everything becoming everything becoming a fintech and a fintech becoming everything because it all revolves about access to credit and lower interest rate, with both of which are main problems in Brazil and in the whole region uh, um, to a lesser degree. Is that something that is true elsewhere? Do you also see that in the other emerging markets that you talked about? Because the, 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 this, this vertical SaaS approach that, I mean, you want to invest in, in educational SaaS and then channel money through the, the, through the software, invest in HR tech, invest in, in, in construction tech and so forth, and all of them having a fintech angle, uh, has been playing very, very well in Brazil. Uh, and somewhat well throughout the Latin American region. Is that something that is also happening in, in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, India, and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it has. Um, especially in India, there are very interesting examples, again, because it's a, it's a huge market, right, with an with a, with a older ecosystem even. But yes, I think so. I think um, the main pain point remains financial, right? Like, you have to be very worried, and I think this is something that Several foreign investors, especially, have found out like the willingness to pay for SaaS beyond the enterprise in, in Latin America is 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 limited, right? Um, and I think that oftentimes you are competing with you are competing with pen and paper, but you're also competing with hiring another person. And when the cost of labor is is relatively cheap, you know that's sometimes a more viable option than just paying for a SaaS, right? So yeah, I think uh, in a lot of these places, exactly like you know you can you can build again the you, you build the SaaS part, but the way I see it is more of an engagement layer that maximizes recurrence of usage and customer stickiness rather than becoming the main engine of monetization necessarily. Um, and yeah, the main way to monetize is arguably through financial systems, sorry, through financial services. The problem is that to be able to offer financial services responsibly and do so in a sustainable manner, arguably you have to build, you have to build the, the platform to some degree because you have to have the data access to actually be able to underwrite differentially, or at least seek to do that to the best of your ability. Um, and you have to try to have as much understanding of your customer as you can, right? So different people have done that differently. Uh, and obviously the nature of the financial service that you can offer on top of the SaaS varies by vertical, right? Of, of, the, of the real economy. But, but yes, I think that that remains the main pain point and you see that across emerging markets. And Carlos, what's your take or what's the firm's take on, on, on crypto? So we have a DeFi strategy, right? Um, and admittedly, I'm not the best person to to speak about it. We have a partner that leads that. We have two separate funds within the FTC umbrella that are specifically DeFi focused. We've been investing in DeFi since 2017, right? So so clearly, right, uh, we believe in the thesis and we think it's very interesting. I think I would say broadly that, you know, crypto has many... Crypto has many implications, right? I think there's the there's the speculative side of uh, there's the speculative side, of course, which has which fueled a, a massive mania, especially if we look back right to 2021. Um, there's the store of value argument for certain cryptocurrencies, especially for Bitcoin, right? I think that's that's one way to look at it. And then there's the thought about DeFi, right, becoming a part of the financial system, right? And what I would say quickly is that I I don't see DeFi, and I think. Speaking for the firm as well, we don't see DeFi as a replacement to the to the financial system. We don't think it's going to completely erase the way it exists right now. We think I think that it's going to be, and we're seeing that it's susceptible to a certain re level of of regulation from from centralized entities, right? That are definitely not decentralized, but we do see a place for it um, in what is a massive, massive, you know, network of intertwined institutions, and we think it, it, it is here to stay, and it will continue to. And it will continue to play out in the in the next year. So we think there's very interesting. We think there's very interesting companies being built in this space. I can imagine that in the crypto pipeline, it must be very different use cases in uh, in developed markets and all versus developing markets, right? I mean, companies in the U.S. must be approaching a whole different angle than they are approaching in Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, and Middle East. Uh, how do you see that? Yeah, absolutely. You're totally right. Um, 
again, right? Also, DeFi, by the way, right? Like the beauty of it is that you can build a company from anywhere, right? It, it is by nature decentralized. So I think sometimes you're not sure where these teams actually are, right? Like they're building certain use cases that can be, if you have enough engineering firepower, you can be in Mexico or you can be in Switzerland, right? Um, but yeah, fundamentally, I think you're right. I mean, the, the appeal of crypto, right, is especially strong in emerging markets because you bypass a lot of the structural issues that many of these economies have. Um, and you offer an avenue for alternative, you know, for alter- an alternative route, right? For people, especially, especially younger people that are more prone for adoption. Um, you know, we think about stable, stable coin usage, for example, in, in Latin America, right? That's, that, that's a clear example, right? It's no coincidence that one of the countries that has the most complicated macro context, if you will, in the region, which is Argentina, is also, I mean, it also helps that there's massive engineering talent there in great institutions, right? But great, great universities, at least. But but yeah, I mean, that's one of the places where you see the most crypto adoption and you see the most innovation in crypto within the region. Um, but yes, you know, you, again, right? Like, given the different context, the, the needs for crypto is, the, the, the need for crypto is, I think, quite different than developed to developing markets. Would you comment a little bit about how do you see crypto use cases differently from um, Latin America, Middle East, Southeast Asia, India? I'm very curious about India. I mean, in South America, it's a very, very um, common thing to have like the stable coins, how to invest in, in, in developed currency. Uh, in Argentina, of course, people use it a lot in their day-to-day activities, uh, Venezuela and so forth. I don't know if, that, if that's going on in the Middle East and Southeast Asia. You know, I'm honestly, I don't have the expertise to comment on that in in those other markets. I'll, I'll be I'll be completely honest with you. Uh, so, Symmetrix, that was a very very interesting company. Uh, we 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 got to know the company. Alejo is an amazing founder and and and, and so forth. And then it's a great example about how big Latin American companies can go abroad and build uh, um, global strategies. And in this case, they have a different flavor about the global South. Uh, about building something not not in the very very uh, common U.S. centric point of view. Um, would you comment a little yeah. bit about your 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 experience in Symmetric? I think that's one of the best examples you have in the region. Of course, um, yeah. So yeah, you're right. Like Symmetric is Symmetric is a very interesting case because it is a company that fundamentally is solving a problem that is arguably more acute in emerging markets than it is in developed markets. It doesn't mean that there's no place for symmetric in developed markets. In fact, they've already signed a couple of net new customers in the United States. Um, but arguably, the, the product market fit will look somewhat different. That's something the company will not be exploring over the next over the next few years. But what I would say is, look, I mean, what I'm saying makes sense when you think about the fact that the, pro- the proliferation of alternative payment methods in emerging markets has been even steeper than it has been in developed markets. Part of it is because, quite honestly, the methods of payment in developed markets work better to begin with. And even if there's room for improvement, right, in emerging markets, they were just way behind. Um, so with the proliferation of alternative payment methods, right, like the need for financial reconciliation um, and the need for agility for a tool there that provides both robustness and agility, which is what Symmetric really strives to do, um, becomes even greater, right? So I would say that that's why, especially... You know, having learned that within like the the inner mechanism of Rappi, which is really where the company, you know, sort of like developed the the understanding of the part market fit, right? I think that the urgency for it and therefore the willingness to pay would not have been as high, arguably initially in um in developed markets. So so yeah, I mean it's it's been fascinating to see. It's it's I have and, and that was part of the narrative of the series B that was so hard to explain. Um it, it's very difficult to explain to someone that no, symmetric doesn't have a direct parallel in developed markets. Actually, it makes more sense even in developing markets when you think about this. But it could, it it could and will end up in in developed markets as well. That was that's not an easy point to make. Like most people think that's delusional, right? Um, and that was a difficult part of the pitch. So so yeah, that, that that's part of that. But I'm happy to speak about other parts of my experience with the company if if you want to be more specific. No, it's it's already hard to explain about a Latin American company going uh, to develop market. I can imagine how hard it is to explain about a Latin American company being able to go to all the developing markets. Uh, yeah. Do you see more examples of that, of Latin American companies trying to build this global south approach? Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah, for sure. I mean, look, I think the local is a very good example, right? Like part of the reason why... 
part of the reason why Symmetric, I think the the first reason why Symmetric had left Latin America, if I'm not mistaken, was because of the logo. Um, I think eBanks is following in that path, um, and definitely, you know, I, I and, and and I think definitely succeeding. So, you know, when you think about infrastructure, right? Like, I think that's and especially from a soft from a from a SaaS perspective, right? That's the easiest way to be able to do that. The problem, obviously, with other models is that if there's more of a regulatory heavy approach, that that would just take a lot longer, right? It takes a lot longer to operate in many places. Um, for example, a company like Nubank could very well expand to other countries in developing markets. I don't doubt that the product market fit exists, and I don't doubt that that they can do a better job than some of the local players. But getting there, getting the licenses that are needed, etc. Like they've already, we've already seen that it was hard enough for them to do it in Mexico. Uh, and, and they're still now, you know, battling for a full banking license. It, it, you know, imagine doing it in Nigeria, right? Um, so it's, so it's difficult. Um, but yeah, we see it, we see it there. And I mean, honestly, we see it more with companies in other emerging markets. Like we have a company, a payments company called Thunderwave in Africa, um, that has grown massively over the last seven years or so. You know, those guys have some business outside of the African continent. Um, and certainly they can, they can export their solution beyond Africa, right? I think for them, it's already been hard enough to be able to operate in as many African markets as they do. And that goes back to my prior point, right? Like Latin America, you know, does have a beautiful thing in the size of the main market, especially Brazil and secondarily Mexico, right? Like that is something that is very, very difficult to find. In Africa, if by nature you have to go multi-country from the start, it, it makes growth inherently harder. I can imagine that. And, and how do you balance this approach about companies growing internationally, companies staying in their main market, um, companies growing regionally, uh, pan-regionally, and so forth? Because you have like Colombian companies growing in Mexico, you have Mexican companies who are becoming like true Mexican champions. Brazil, of course, is a place where you can go from zero to a billion in, in, in one market. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you have to be realistic about the business model and what that entails, right? Um, and I think that, for example, in a company like, you know, in a company like Symmetric, again, right, the, the regulatory risk was lower from the start. So we were less concerned about an expansion strategy, even though we didn't anticipate it to be as fast as it has become. Um, when you look at a company, you know, when you look at a company like Nino, for example, right, that is much more subject to the regulation of the local market, um, I think that in Mexico, in this case, like you have to believe that the that the use case or the size of the opportunity in the local market is truly big enough, right? Leaving room for upside um, in a in a bullish case, right? If, if it's able to expand beyond the region, but that's one of the reasons I think why you have to why when you make the business case, the investments case in the beginning, you have to believe that the local market is is big enough to sustain the outcome that you need. Like typically, that's that's how it is. Um, in the case of Matilda, you know we. We saw from the beginning why there was more flexibility and why the distribution partnerships will be able to take them to other countries quicker. Um, you know, for the size of the opportunity to truly make venture sense, they have to dom they have to dominate Spanish speaking Latin. So, so that was already intentional from the start. But ideally, you want the local market to be big enough, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing a a more bipolar a, a more bipolarization, if you will, of of Latin America in tech, right? Where you have two main hubs is what I mean. You have Sao Paulo. For the Brazilian market, which, as you say, certainly has enough uh, critical mass, and then you have Mexico City for Spanish speaking Latin. Like today, if you go to Mexico City, you see a plethora of founders that are speaking Spanish, but a lot of which are not Mexican. You see a bunch of Chileans, you see a bunch of Colombians, you see people from, I mean, even Spanish people, right? Like as well. yeah. a bunch of Spanish. Correct, correct. Why is that? I think I would argue that part of it is because the Mexican market is bigger than their home markets, right? For for fintech or tech opportunities. Um, and they understand that if they want to be able to raise, you know, to reach enough scale and raise bigger rounds, they actually have to be in Mexico, right? Their home markets are not sufficient. So yeah, I think it's no coincidence that you're that you're seeing that. So seizing this uh, this this point that you made about uh the international crowd in Mexico, we see several startups starting to talk about the Latino US strategy. So going, so going from Mexico to, especially through Monterrey, I mean, you start going to Houston and, and, and so forth and targeting this crowd, which and has a lot of Mexican components. It has the, the culture is much more similar to Mexico than, than to the classical US approach and so forth. 
but we haven't exactly seen a good number of examples of company um, actually breaking that code, actually trying to do that. Um, in your portfolio, do you see a lot of them trying to to, to take this approach and to, trying to make that leap? Into the U.S. Latino population? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a very good question. I think the U.S. Latino market, broadly speaking, is is a difficult one to conquer. Um, I have seen many companies over the last years that are trying to do that. Uh, and, I, and I think there's many reasons why. There's a few reasons why, right? One of, one of the reasons I think it's actually a much more heterogeneous market than people realize. Um, I think when you look at second generation Hispanics versus first generation immigrants, right? There's, there's a big difference in what these people are looking for and why. Um, I think that, you know, when you look at where these people come from, right? Like I think, uh, you know, uh, a Mexican person in Arizona is pretty different to a Cuban person in Miami. Right. Like I think in many ways there's similarities, but when you're actually offering financial services, when you're appealing to these people, the distribution channels, like there's a, there's a decent amount of heterogeneity. Um, is what I'm sensing from people that I think understand this space quite well. And, um, and quite frankly, I don't think I, I see a lot of companies in the U S that have been trying to do this that have not been able to crack the, you know, the product roadmap that better suits the needs of these of these customers i don't really know why uh i think it's a big question i know a lot of the funds in the region are grappling with this with this discussion uh you know we're, we're, at... we're including we're including i mean we've been trying to to yeah. see how this would play out because the latino u.s market is larger than the the latin american market as a whole i mean it's a it's a, it's a gigantic yeah. economy uh someone yeah, will true. have to crack that code uh but this heterogeneous um comment is very interesting I mean, they are indeed very different right not only the the the, the generations yeah. but also where the people come from where they live what are they they looking for yeah yeah and by the way i mean look i i and also like i you know I, i'm not completely convinced that you also need a net new company if, if you believe the if you believe the heterogeneous comment right then then why is a net new solution better positioned than some of the existing neo banks in the U.S. that have already achieved scale and are and are arguably going to become increasingly more capable of targeting these people, right? Uh, you know, we have a company like Moneyline that we took from pitch tech to IPO, right? The, you know, Moneyline Moneyline was built to be a challenger bank for Middle America, right? In many ways, the the financial right the financial difficulties that a lot of the U.S. Hispanics are facing are not that different to the ones that middle and you know that people in Middle America are facing. Arguably, right? They come in different flavors, uh, but there are some similarities, right? So, you know, I could see, I could see a company like Moneyline, even if it's not its current focus, becoming more and more able to tackle this market, right? So, so yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, honestly, I yeah, I, I I've been asking myself that question, and 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 I think that I think you know the heterogeneity of the population is something I'm very mindful of. So therefore. I become very curious about what the best distribution channels are to, to, to approach them. You would think that Univision, Televisa would be obvious solutions. I've seen companies trying that with, you know, questionable success. So that's a question mark. And then there's a part about the product roadmap. Like that, that I have still, yeah, I'm not convinced that the winning solution is out. So we'll continue to keep our eye out on that one for sure. It's a very good question. We love to understand, Carlos, how, how other firms that come to the podcast operate, in part to improve ourselves as well. Uh, and since you guys have been around for a while and you've been at the firm for a few years, can you tell us a bit more about how FinTech Collective works? I mean, I know you guys have different offices and people are spread all over the world. I mean, how do you guys operate? How do you guys make investments and decisions? And what's the day-to-day -day like? Of course. Um Yeah, so we we have two main offices. One is in New York City. The other one is in is in London. We opened London last year because one of our we had a we had um, a new partner join us, focused on Europe. His name is Toby. He's based out of he's based out of London, and we sent a, we sent one of our senior associates there to support the European operation. Um, so we cover Europe from London. We today we cover Latin America from New York with frequent travel. Right, I mentioned I'm in Sao Paulo. Today I was in Mexico City last week. Like I, I, I traveled a good amount. Um, so that's uh that's how we do that. In terms of in terms of how we operate, I would say, look, I mean, you know, my 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 day to day, right, is 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 mostly focused 
leaving fundraising aside, right? It's mostly focused between supporting the portfolio, sourcing, and thematic development, right? I don't think I don't think it's very different to how other venture funds work. Where I do think that we definitely spend more time than the average fund is working with our portfolio, right? Like we have a more concentrated portfolio than several other players that are similar size in AUM, which means that we spend quite a bit of time working with our portfolio companies, staying close to them and supporting them in in whichever way we can. Um, so there, I think, you know, the intentionality of where we spend time is, is, is certainly reflected. That's, that's an observation I would make. How concentrated is the portfolio now that you mentioned that? Yeah. So look, uh, for, uh, for our current fund, right. That is, that is 200 million USD, right? Like we have a 15 to 24 positions in total, right? So that gives you, that gives you sense. Yeah. And you you mentioned before several examples of companies that you took from pretty much seed or Series A into to IPO or to successful exits. How does the firm or how do you guys think about about liquidity? This is something that I mean we've been around since 2016, and it's obviously a question that we get a, a lot from our from our LPs. And 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 to be fair, I mean the 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 asset class, the the VC asset class in Spain is not not as well known. So this is this is like common questions from from less sophisticated LPs. Let's put it that way. But how do you guys think about about liquidity? So, for example, we've had funds on the on the podcast that say, "Hey, if we invest at seed, when Series C or Series D happens, we'll 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 sell a small a uh, small part in secondaries and return some capital to LPs." We've had some other firms who say, well, "If if we think it's a winner, we're 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 riding it all the way, even post IPO." H- how do you guys think about that? Yeah, I think if you look at our track record, um, there's examples of as you say, writing it all the way to the to the IPO. Um, and there's examples of of exactly having taken some chips off the table, if you will, at different moments, right? I think I think given the the sectors in which we focus, right, like the opportunity the opportunity for strategic acquisitions, um, you know, for private equity type, you know, acquis- acquisition interest is is substantial, right? And I think that that offers opportunities for liquidity that would be less common, right, in, in in other sectors, right? Then you would rely more on public markets or just outright M&A, right, from, from another player in the space. Um, so that's something that's certainly facilitated, right, the, you know, our, our, our strategy from a liquidity perspective. Um, but look, it's a, it's a very good question, right? Like I think, I think um, I would say two things. Number one is that I think that the expectations of LPs when it comes to liquidity have certainly become you know, I've certainly evolved in the last few years, right? Especially given sort of like the difference in the market context. So, you know, I think that the the, the strategy has to evolve accordingly as we look at future funds. I think that's very important. Um, and secondly, I would say, look, it's it's especially important question when you look at Latin America and emerging markets, right? Where liquidity options are certainly more challenging than they are in the United States or even or even Europe, right? So it's something that you can't you you can't think about liquidity uniformly across geographies, right? Because there are there are important differences. Would you say that the U.S. LPs, the more institutional ones, uh, and and supposedly more knowledgeable ones, uh, understand these traits, these differences between the regions and the, and the assignments? Yeah, I think they do. I think that's part of the reason why they, you know, I think that's part of the reason why they've taken some time to warm up, right, to the idea of of, of emerging markets, and that, and I think that that's. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons. One of the reasons why, when you, when you showcase, I think the Atlantico report does a great job of showing this. When you showcase the exit landscape in Latin America versus other regions like India or Southeast Asia, as I mentioned before, which are older ecosystems, you could say, you know, LATAM in many ways the exit landscape actually looks more promising, has already looked more promising, right? And that's, I think, a compelling argument to make. Really, you have more exit uh, track record. Not not FTC. I mean, the FTC the ecosystem in general have more exit track record in in Latam than they do in uh, in, in Southeast Asia and India. I didn't know that. Yeah, if you look at the efficiency of 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 exits, yeah, it's um, according to the Atlantico report from what I remember, it's 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 superior. That's very interesting. So, a couple of questions here about uh, about pipeline. Um, the first one is. In your current pipeline, what are you seeing? What trends? What kind of companies? What kind of um, of strategies are you seeing that most excite you today? I mean, you have companies that are building from Latin America or and or Africa to go abroad to go to developed markets. Companies building to go to global south. 
companies building to become uh, local champions, like you mentioned, vertical SaaS, B2B SaaS, DeFi, and, and, and other all kinds of models trying to approach this new way of wiring money. Um, what's, what are the, the, the things in your queuing pipeline that excite you the most? And the second one is what do you think in 10 years will, will, will be most exciting? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that, look, I, I think when you look at pipeline, there's a few things, right? I think uh, when you look at developed markets, for example, like the the availability of, of, of alternative investments and sort of like the, pro, the proliferation and fragmentation to, to democratize it, if you will, is, is something very interesting. That's something that we, that we've been looking at. Um, and there's several investments, uh, that, that we've considered that, that sort of touch that theme. So I think that that's very interesting. Um, and I think that speaks to a broader, a broader theme of wealth transfer, right? Like I think, I think that the empowerment of millennials that we're seeing at a global, at a global scale is, is, is very interesting. That entails a massive growth, uh, wealth transfer. And, and the way these people, um, right, the way this, the, 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 the way millennials manage their wealth, invest it and prioritize it relative to prior generations is, is fundamentally different, right? So ALT is a very good example of how that plays out. But that theme more broadly, I think, opens a whole host of, of opportunities. Um, so those are a few things that I, that I think I, that, that I think we look at and are, and are mindful of. Um, I continue to look at, on, on, on another note, I mean, Symmetric has opened my eyes to sort of like the reconfiguration of the CFO stack. You know, Symmetric has massive ambitions and basically, you know, restructuring the CFO stack for the 21st century. Uh, but there's other companies that are taking different approaches to doing that, right? And I think that that is an area where Gen AI and the introduction of Gen AI has a particular, has particular upside to, to, to disrupt. Um, I think, you know, Obviously, everyone has talked about the introduction of Gen AI. We, we don't invest in AI companies that are just AI companies, right? Like that's not what we do, but we obviously are very mindful of how it can impact future trends and how it can impact our current portfolio. And when I look at future trends, I would definitely think that in the, you know, in the CFO stack realm, there's, there's significant room for disruption quite fast. Um, so that's something that I, that's something that I continue to look at and, and that I'm mindful of. Um, you asked me about, about 10 years from now, right? Look, I think that maybe let me make an observation. I think that in 10 years that there will be another or another generation of massive B2C fintech companies. Um, and these will be inherently very different to, to the ones that have made it in this most recent generation, right? Um, as someone told me the other day, right? Like there is, there is room for another new bank in Brazil. But it's not going to look like Nubank, right? It has to look fundamentally different because if it looked like Nubank, right? Everybody, there's already enough competitors in that space. When when a company is category defining, it's not going to stand. It's not going to be stand alone. There's going to be room for others that are at least going to try to build smaller versions of it, right? Um, and I think that that's where one has to think about: okay, how can Gen AI, which is a paradigm shift, right, from a tech perspective, empower? the next generation of B2C fintech companies, right? Like right now there's massive, massive attention on B2B to C models, B2B models, right? And look, the majority of what we've done historically is there, but we also do believe in the potential for B2C fintech, right? As markets recover and we are cautiously optimistic, right? I think that and funding becomes more available, I think we're going to see more B2C models grow again, right? Like we had, especially during 2020, 2021. Um, but this generation is going to look drastically different. I, I can't tell you exactly what it would look like, but I, but I am confident that, that there will be future winners that are, that are more direct to consumer. And, and obviously these, I think the way these companies are going to leverage Gen AI is going to be drastically different to the ones now. Um, and that's where, and that's where when I look at like sort of like the, the existing infrastructure in Brazil, it's, it's very, it's, it, it becomes a differential, right? Like the type of company you can build in Brazil. That's consumer facing, leveraging peaks, leveraging open banking, um, is very, very different to what you can do in, to what you can do in other, in other countries that don't, that don't have those, those building blocks, right? And that's why, again, the role of the regulator is so important because it, it really sets the stage to be able to build different things. Super interesting. Carlos, the two closing questions that we ask every single guest. Can you recommend us a book? Or some form of content, and can you also suggest or recommend someone to invite to the podcast that hasn't been on before? Of course. Um, 
Yeah. So in terms of in terms of a book, um, since we're speaking about venture capital, I I think one book I would recommend is The Power Law. It basically it's basically the history of the venture capital industry, and I think it puts things in very good perspective for people to understand how things began, how things were, you know, how how they sort of evolved to what happened in 2020, 2021. And now the, and you know, now the future chapters have to be written, no? Um, in what happens now and sort of where we level out, whether it's back to, you know, pre, you know, the 2017 levels or whether it's going to be somewhere in between that and where we were in, you know, in 2020, 2021, right? So I think that book is very interesting. Um, there's another book called Out Innovate, right? I think, I believe, written by, written by Alex Lazaro, who himself is, leads a VC called Fluent, which talks about how sort of uh, Silicon Valley has become disintermediated as a center of innovation. And now you have centers of innovation in many different parts of the globe, uh, which I believe in, right? I mean, that's a testament to the type of work that I do and why I'm in Sao Paulo today. And I was in Mexico City last week, right? So that's also a, that's also a very interesting book. So I would recommend those. Um, in terms of someone to recommend for the podcast, um, well, look, I mean, I think... I think that uh, for many of the reasons that we touched on today, I mean, I think Alejo, both Alejo and Santi, the co-founders of Symmetric, would be, I think, would be good additions to uh, to the podcast. They're both very different people with different approaches, but I mean, I think their their experience of building a, a fintech company that is cross border and and has the potential to do something that became more pressing in emerging markets before expanding to developed markets is a very interesting conversation to be had. They can take that part of the conversation today and take it to a whole other level, right? So I think I would recommend that. Awesome. Thanks for the suggestion. And thanks also for your time. Thank you, Carlos. It was a pleasure. Thank you, guys. Amazing. Really enjoyed it.